Hey guys, Montel here, and thanks so much for tuning in to this edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. And you know, the one thing we love to do here at Let's Be Blunt with Montel is to bring you as much up-to-date information and science-related information to the benefits of cannabis and hemp, period. That's the only reason why this podcast exists. I want to make sure that you get the information that you need so that when you go to some of these dispensaries and you come in contact with some of the people that are working there, and I'm not knocking anybody who works in dispensaries, but you're coming in contact with people who really don't take the time to do as much research as they should be doing when they make recommendations to you on products that you and your family could use. And so I want to make sure we bring you the up-to-date information, the most up-to-date information that's out there and available, and give you an opportunity to hear from the experts yourself. And my guest today is just one of those experts. He graduated from both Harvard and Harvard Medical School and trained at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and is currently a faculty on faculty at both Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Med School. He has spent many years working with the underserved, particularly providing care for veterans, having treated countless patients harmed by alcohol and drugs. His observations that he had never seen a cannabis overdose led him to delve deeply into the science of cannabis safety and treatment. He's a frequent speaker, speaker excuse me an author on a variety of topics related to medical applications of cannabis, and he is the president of the Association of Cannabis Specialists, which aims to educate clinicians, lawmakers, and the industry about best practices needed and best tools needed for proper patient care. Dr. Jordan Tischler, thank you so much for being with us and joining us here today on Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Well, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be here. Absolutely, sir. No, and thank you. And you know, I'm going to let you know ahead of time, you are always invited back because uh, what we'd love right. to do is make sure that our, our viewers and listeners get the most up-to-date information out there. And I know that you stay right on the pulse. But uh, let's start off for, for a second. Let's let's go backwards for a minute and talk a little bit about which where, where you're, how you started. What was your intent? You got into the medical field, but where are you from and, and how did you get started in medicine? Well, um, I grew up here in the Boston area. I, I live in the same town that I grew up in, uh, which sounds kind of funny as I say it, um, but it's true. Um, and I got into medicine because it was sort of the family business. Both my parents were docs um, and uh, my wife is a doc. And uh, that sort of drove me in that direction. The odd bit of backstory here is that while I was becoming a doc. I also spent um, the roughly 30 years in the entertainment industry on the music side. Um, so I had a um, mixing and recording studio and uh, got to work with people from sort of all walks of life, um, including mixing for some well-known people um, who I probably won't mention. Oh, that's, that's unbelievable. Did you play an instrument yourself? Um, I play a range of instruments. I always say I play enough of a bunch of instruments that I can be a good producer, which is really what I did. Um, but I'm certainly not, you know, sort of godlike on any of them. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so you're, you're, you start your career off that way, but then you're going to med school at the same time. And, um, what, I, 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 when did you first start to think about cannabis as a medicine? Because it's very different for most in your field. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, the, the bio that you read actually really is pretty on point in the sense that, um, you know, throughout medical school and my early career, you know, cannabis wasn't on the radar. Um, and when, the, the you know, one, I mean, to stop you right there for just a second, but doesn't that shock you? Because I'm, I'm trying when you, you probably went through med school in the 90s. Yes, early 90s. Yeah, early 90s. So while you were going to med school in the early 90s, the U.S. government was spending, you know, close to 50, 60 million dollars a year funding research in places like Israel on cannabis with doctors like Dr. Mashulam. Right. And they had been funding it already. They had already been funding research at the University of Mississippi. They had been funding research for, at that point in time, about 20 years. So there was a lot of data that was always a, already available that they could have started schooling doctors like yourself when we go through the training protocols. I mean, they could have started, you know, giving you information way back then, but um, they didn't. Doesn't that seem to be just counterintuitive to you? Or uh, uh, I just think I'd go beyond counterintuitive and say mind blowing. Um, I mean, the reality here is that we have known 
in in very reasonable data driven fashion that cannabis was useful for various types of problems since the early 70s basically from as as soon as it was put on the controlled substances act not only were there legal challenges to its non utility for medical purposes which is one of the key criteria for being in schedule 1 where it is but on top of that, that we had all this data that suggested that it was useful. I mean, there were studies from as early as 73, 74 that showed conclusive benefit for use in uh, chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting in uh, uh, both cancer related and non-cancer related pain control. Um, yeah, so it, it is mind blowing that this was not even a discussion through my medical training. And then, then, I mean, just jump to the day, it still seems to be mind-blowing to me that, you know, it, we, we have to beat doctors over the head with a stick to make them recognize that what they've asked for has already been done. I mean, I, one of the biggest things I hear from people is, oh, well, we need to have more research. I feel like smacking somebody on your side of the head. Excuse me. You know, you've allowed your elected officials to waste money for the last five decades studying cannabis at the University of Mississippi and putting out peer review study after peer review study after peer review study, how many more studies do we need? I think the answer to that is is a little complicated. I think that the answer from uh, from sort of the political point of view is that anyone who says that there's not enough data um, isn't reading what there is. Um, and, and I think that that really is a political statement. I mean, I think about, you know, um, when Mrs. Clinton was running for a presidency and, you know, and she said, well, I think we need more data. And I kept thinking, no, we don't. well, needing more data is inarguable, right? I mean, there's no field in medicine where we can't do more studies and learn uh, at a deeper level. So that becomes inarguable to say that. But the real question is, do we have enough data and is the data high enough quality to make some determinations about its utility as a medical treatment? And I think the answer is, is resoundingly yes, of course we do. And that was really formalized in 2017 with the report from the National Academy in which they said, amongst other things, that for pain management, the evidence was incontrovertible. And that's their word, not my word. Um, and I mean, so, I think, but if you went back even before that to you oh, know, yeah. the first Daddy Bush, G, uh, you know, it was G.W. Bush, when he implemented the first compassionate care program that was allowing 21 patients in this country to be card carrying cannabis members in the United States that have done so now for the last 40 years. And we followed them. We studied them. You want to talk about a longitudinal study. That's a longitudinal study looking at the benefits for so many different maladies that were authorized for use. And yet, and I mean, I, 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 I go back. I mean, it, it, it becomes almost a waste of time quoting all the different studies back in 2000. It was in 1999 when under Bill Clinton, um, uh, I think it was General McCaffrey, did a study out of the you know, University of Southern California that came back and said that this was probably one of the most egregiously offensive things that the U.S. government had ever done by outlawing cannabis. Um, you know, and, and, and throughout all of those periods of time when people were saying, no, 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 we need more studies, the U.S., our taxpayer dollars were going to Israel to pay for those studies. Absolutely. Um I know I get a little riled up, but I'm, you know, I'm excited <laughs> to have a good doctor on. I can talk to very you. riling, especially when you start to look at the way in which it was. I mean, you know, on some level, the real issue here is that this was never a medical or scientific decision on the part of the government. You know, they didn't ask any physicians or scientists at the time that they created the Controlled Substances Act. The reality here is that they wanted to make cannabis and heroin illegal and they had lost a Supreme Court ju judgment in 1969 that was based on the, the um, prohibition from 37, and they needed another way to do it. So they decided that they were gonna take a medical approach, but they weren't basing it on medical facts, and it was a political decision. And it was a political decision back in 1937. Most people don't even understand right. that when it was initially outlawed, it was banned and became part of the Marijuana Tax Act. And within two years of that, Doctors in New York and doctors in uh, across the country signed on to, I think it was the De La Guardia report, the La Guardia report that talked about the fact back in 1941 
that this was one of the most egregiously offensive things that doctors could have possibly done. And people don't even know that the person who ended up making it, who really was the champion for making it illegal, Anslinger, was the key leader of prohibition for alcohol. But while he was the leader of prohibition against alcohol, he was a supporter of cannabis use. He actually made several speeches talking about the fact that cannabis was a less violent um, euphoria than those who were using alcohol. And he suggested that people use cannabis over alcohol. But when he lost his job for alcohol, yeah, he wanted to find something to do. So he got his two buddies, William Randolph Hearst and DuPont, to fund you know, his initiatives for 30, 40 years in the future. Yep. I was, it was um, both very clever and very dastardly. Very dastardly, yes. And so now, well, so, okay, I'm going to go back again. You start off as a doctor and you weren't being trained on this, but when did you first recognize that, hey, there's something about this cannabis thing that we're missing the boat on? When did you first, when was that first revelatory for you? I actually sort of had one of those aha moments. Um, there were a bunch of news stories from Massachusetts here in about this ballot initiative to talk about medical marijuana. Um, and, and I, and I thought, gee, you know, what, what about, what is this stuff? Like, I mean, I knew about it from a recreational point of view to be sure, but the aha moment was when I started thinking, well, you know, maybe there's something to this, uh, medical concept. And I've seen so many of these veterans who've been really harmed by all these other substances and really, I mean, alcohol, I mean, it's alcohol one through nine, and then maybe there's something else down there. Um, you know, if these guys are so sick from these garden variety substances like alcohol, and I've never seen anybody sick in my emergency department from cannabis, then cannabis can't be really all that toxic now, can it? So I started to think, well, all right, what I need here is the science. So maybe there is, maybe there isn't. And at the time, if you went to PubMed and put in the word cannabis, you would get back about 23,000 studies, which is a stunning number of studies. Um, what year was this? What year was this? This would have been 2011. Okay. All right. Um, and, and, you know, cannabis is the most studied substance ever, bar none. And for comparison, about that time in, in history where you would get 23,000 studies back on cannabis, you'd get about 5,000 back on, on alcohol, um, just for comparison's sake. And, you know, the problem with 23,000 <laughs> studies is that it's really, really hard to read them and make sense of them. And I think that that has, in fact, led to some problems with the dissemination of, our, of, of knowledge. But I sat down and I started reading it. And, you know, it took me several years of reading this stuff and really trying to sort out what was legit, what was not legit, what study designs were appropriate, how much the researchers' inherent biases came into play. There was one particular researcher out of Yale um, who was very well known at the time, and he would write these, he would do these studies that would sort of you know, start at the beginning and you would follow the logic and the follow the logic and you'd be like, oh, this actually looks pretty good. And then at the conclusion, you say, yes, but it's bad for you. <laughs> you know, and you'd be like, wait a minute, what was the point of that? So right. Yeah, they're, they're, kind of, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. You, you learn the cast of characters, right? And so you start to know the position that these people start from and you can start to read the, the chain of evidence from, from that. And, uh, and that's really helpful. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's been a lot, you're, you're right, a lot of studies done here in the United States, a lot of studies in Canada, or all over the world. And, you know, I think they can be kind of divided into two groups, you know, one, the group that wanted to prove the, you know, the theory that it was bad. And the other one that just was trying to seek out whether or not there's any value. But none of them just, you know, well, no, I take that back. There, there's probably about 30% of them. So I break it in three there's 30 percent of them that entered the study saying i'm going to see where the data leads me right and you know we have enough of those studies out there right now that the data is leading to the right place and the right place is that this should have never been made illegal to begin with and number two now we should be doing more research on how much more efficaciously we could be distributing this product there's not a lot of research being done. And, and I'll also say, you know, the cannabis industry is probably our, you know, um, uh, biggest 
I, 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 enemy in some ways. Sometimes I, I don't know if you saw this this thing that just came out a couple of days about uh, days ago about a group out in California who literally took a crystalline form of of THC and you know, because in the crystalline form, the way they process it, it comes out white. So now they came up with this stump that's called, you know, canna bumps. Come on to give people the idea that they can, you know, snort it like they used to snort cocaine and get a high. And of course, it's like 600 milligrams. Are you kidding me? That would be the first thing that the Fed's going to come and smack us over the head with. It's like we can be our worst enemies, not understanding that. Two things. One, I talk about it here quite a bit on Let's Be Blunt. I think that the one thing this industry has done poorly is though we have done a great job b2b education we have done really one of the worst jobs in medicine from a b2c the, the business to the consumer model we do not educate the consumer we don't give them the information we treat them like i think you know big pharma does and that they're not smart enough to understand the information but the, the public is smarter than we think i think you know we the the problem that I see is um, that this industry is so focused on immediate profits that they don't think long term. And so they're not as focused on developing, you know, credibility and sort of the long play the way the way the way pharma does. I mean, pharma thinks in terms of decades um, and and I'm not making apologies for pharma. They have their pluses and they have their minuses to be sure. But I think that, you know, the cannabis industry needs to start thinking about longer term uh, staying power and really start kind of playing nice in the sandbox. You know, at the moment, I find that a lot of my patients get um, derailed in their treatment when they go to the dispensary because the dispensary says things like, oh, you should buy more or you should buy these chocolate bars or, you know, some key for white powder of THC or whatever it is. Um, and then the patients go home and they don't know what they're doing with it because it wasn't something that I instructed them to get. And they use it in some fashion. And oftentimes they feel pretty sick from it. And uh, and and we lose the credibility for the whole thing. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, well, well, we left the, the recommendation up to a bud tender who is getting a couple of dollars on the side to promote a particular product yep. or their dispensary is getting a couple of dollars on the side to promote a particular product rather than taking into a, account the needs of the patient. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I with you 100% with that. And, you know, so where, where did you, did, when did you first start to discover information about like the endocannabinoid system? Oh, that was back in sort of the 2011 period um, when I started doing my homework to get interested, educated about this. You know, I mean, I really started by thinking, gee, this is kind of interesting. I wonder what this is about. And then sort of the more I read, the more I realized that there really was uh, the level of data that we need and that this could be useful for people. And it was then that I sort of think, well, you know, I work for the federal government. That's not going to work. Um, and, uh, even my affiliation with the Harvard hospitals, that wasn't going to work. So I ended up starting my private practice in Hale MD, not because I ever intended or wanted to be in private practice, but that was really the only vehicle by which I could go from having a bunch of knowledge because I got interested in it to actually then, you know, practicing this kind of medicine and making sure that people get what they need from it. Um, and it's been really interesting because, you know, we're, we were talking there about how the bud tenders aren't um, sort of living up to, to what we hope from, from them. And then the other bit of it is that there are a lot of physician groups out there who see themselves as, as just providing a card, right? Their job is access. And, um, you know, if you go back historically and you look at the, the origins of this in California in 96, there was a lot of pressure on physicians that they couldn't really talk about this. But those days are long over. And I think the idea that a physician or any clinician simply says, yes, go get some weed and let some kid tell you how to do it. I think that's malpractice. I mean, very fundamental to the practice of medicine is this idea of informed consent. And not only do you therefore need to get consent, but it has to be consent based on 
first making sure that the person understands what we're talking about before they agree to it. And so I don't think go get some weed as, as, as living up to that standard. So for me and my practice, we always focus on the patient uh, and what the patient needs and making sure that they are well educated and that we are available to answer their questions um, and solve problems as they come up. Because frankly, we don't want them getting advice from, from those bud tenders partially because, as you pointed out, they have a conflict of interest. They're selling the product. They're always going to be pushing to buy more and use more and that sort of thing. But also, I think it's somewhat unfair for us to expect a bud tender who you know, maybe is a college graduate, but certainly doesn't have a medical degree, to be in the position of trying to give medical advice without that kind of a license and background and otherwise qualification. It's just not, it's not fair to them. It's not fair to the patient. It creates liability. Um, we need to look at the pharmacy system. The pharmacy system is really buttoned down. If you go in to and talk to the cashier and ask, what have you got for my back pain? They're well trained to say, I'm not the person to answer that question. Let me get you to the pharmacist. And the pharmacist knows the limit of their expertise and often will say, you know, you need to talk to your doctor. And I think that in the dispensary, if somebody comes in and says, what have you got for my back pain? The best answer is you need to talk to a cannabis doctor. Here's a list, you know, go talk to those people, come back to us with a prescription and we'll happily fill it. And I actually think we do need to move in the direction of having a cannabis prescription so that when I write it, number one, I'm responsible for it. And number two is I know that it, the patient will get what it is that I think they need so that it's there's no kind of like, gee, what really happened kind of thing, you know? Right. I think, well, and then that's going to come when we get more and more data. You know, I think one of the things that I really like about the New Jersey law over the New York state law is the fact that in the New Jersey law, now they are going to, you know, um, look favorably upon those dispensaries that collect data on every single person that purchases cannabis from them. So and you're part of your requirement, if you go into a dispensary and you buy something, if it's a medical dispensary, you have to sign a waiver that says that you're going to give them back feedback on what it is you purchased so that we can start collecting this volume. And, and really, this is what we're going to need is volumes and volumes of data on experiences. But the, one of the issues that we have with that is the fact that the industry hasn't matured enough to reach a point where th there's going to have to be this fine line between pharmaceuticalizing cannabis and leaving it a natural substance. I, I know that sounds a little strange, but, you know, I think there are some pharmaceutical practices that I think are well deserved and, and should be implemented when it comes to, let's say, you know, everybody talks about different strains and they don't even know what they're talking about when they're talking about different strains. People talk about sativa versus indica. They don't even know that that's not even a real legitimate differentiation between these two products. But what you can look at are cultivars and a cultivar of a particular plant that is grown. If we can, and I'm not gene map, if we could gene map that and understand, okay, this is the genetics of that particular plant and yes, we can clone that to the within 10% of those genetics. And now I might be able to replicate those genetics in a room of, you know, an acre full of, of that particular genetic. And if we now follow good practices in making sure that once we've harvested that plant, when we harvest the next one, we have grown it in the same within 10% the way we grew the last one, then we might be able to say, yeah, every time you go down there, I think you might end up getting the same response out of this particular strain or this particular cultivar. Uh, but make sure that you read the uh, COA before you, you consume it because make sure that the document shows that, yes, the terpenes are within 10%, the you know, flavonoids are within 10%, and the THC, CBD, and CBG, and CBN, all those are within the same 10%. You might get the same reaction, but that's the thing that's so strange about the plant, strange and good about the plant, is that based on each individual and each individual's endocannabinoid system, the response is going to be different. Right? I mean, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I think, maybe. You know, 
in the cannabis space, there's an, a large desire to sort of suggest that that's unique to cannabis. And I don't think that's actually true. That is to say, I mean, everybody reacts differently to the various medicines, the conventional medicines that we use. We have some general guidelines based on sort of average responses, and those are good guidelines and a place to start. But ultimately, with any individual person, we have to say, all right, how did it work? How did it make you feel? How did, um, you know, what were the benefits and what were the problems? And we have to adjust the dose or sometimes we abandon that medicine for a, a different, you know, related medicine. And I, so I think, you know, those principles aren't really all that different. It's just that we have to acknowledge that, um, that there's a lot of moving pieces in the cannabis science world, whether it's different chemicals in a particular strain of cannabis, or ultimately it's a question of how do we take what we've learned from the plant and apply that to a pharmaceutical approach where we are maybe recombining these things out of a bottle, but we're doing it based on the knowledge that we've learned through experimentation using the plant and its various kind of constituents. I think that to your point, there's always going to be a place for the botanical, um, but there's also, I think, a lot that it's going to teach us that will then allow us to, I hate to use the word surpass, but I think that may be accurate, that once we understand what cannabis has taught us, both about the biology of our, of our own selves as organisms, but also the biology of the plant and what it's producing, um, then we may be able to sort of be able to design uh, cannabinoid medicines that are even more targeted than what we can get from the plant material. And it may not be based on cannabinoids that exist in the plant material, but rather through that, you know, typical pharmaceutical approach where we learn how the system works and then we can develop targeted molecules that are completely novel molecules or combinations of molecules, as the case may be, that will then allow us to do even better than what we can do with cannabis. So I think that there's so much exciting stuff to come. I agree. I mean, I, I think that, you know, we are literally like the Wright brothers pushing a wooden plane down a hill right this yeah. minute. We got jets and, and other things coming down the pike that are going to really, you know, I think bring out the best of this plant. And like, you know, um, a plant bay, I, I, have, I don't have an issue at all with, and I'm using that term, which is not a real term, but pharma, pharmacalizing, you know, a plant. But I, I agree with you. I think that there's always going to be a place for the botanical. Um, I think the botanical can be improved upon. I mean, let's go back in time when we knew that there was, you know, only red roses. And now all of a sudden we have every color of the rainbow rose. And that's because science and horticulturists decided and understood how to crossbreed, 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 crossbreed to achieve an objective. And I mean, we look at the fact that you know, right now, uh, depending on which science you read, you know, we know that they have already identified anywhere from 65 to 165 and then maybe even more cannabinoids out there that we've not even discovered yet that still need to be discovered. And then we have to take a look at the interaction between the two and between the, the 165. And then we have to look at the interaction between that 165 and the, you know, the 60 to 70 different terpenes that are there and available. And then we have to take a look and see what it does to the fat, knowing that this is a fat soluble molecule. You know, there's fats that are in cannabinoid cell or, or in cannabis. So we have a lot more research to do. Absolutely. I, think, oh, I was gonna say, but I think one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm constantly, you know, beating our industry over the head with is that as we do this research, that research should be shared with the patient, not held back from the patient. Oh, couldn't couldn't agree with you more. I mean, that absolutely. Um, you know, and I, I I think that my, you know, earlier in our conversation, we you talked about why some doctors are still reluctant to 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 address this. I think that there are certain kinds of studies that haven't been done yet, and that we need to get done. And those are really the large randomized control trials. Sure, there have been some, but you know, not you know, three to five years of, you know, 10,000 or 20,000 participants uh, with real good randomization. And of course, you know, cannabis presents some interesting uh, problems when we talk about randomization, because obviously if you use cannabis, you're likely to feel something from it that's notable 
Uh, and with the placebo, it becomes much harder to figure out what makes an appropriate comparison. The biggest thing that's standing in the way of all of that is the federal government. It takes a lot of time and money and permission in this country at this point to pull off that kind of a study, let alone to do it repeatedly. At the same time, you know, what's going on in D.C. at the moment with uh, Senator Schumer and Al, you know, talking about legalization, I have some qualms about that. Um, it's not that I have a problem with the concept of legalization. I think that it should be legalized, but I'm concerned that the discussion coming out of D.C. does not seem to pay any attention to patients, right? I, you know, look, I mean, you, you're preaching to the choir with that, my friend, because my, my main mantra is take the patient off the battlefield. And that's what we should be doing. We should get them. You know, that's why there's those trucks running around with the big H on the top of them in, in, war, in war zones, because you can get the patient off the battlefield. We can have these arguments all they want in Washington, D.C. And I think, you know, most of the discussions in D.C. Have, as of late have been still focused on decriminalization. And I'm appalled by that because, to be honest with you, I'm not a criminal. And I've never been a criminal using cannabis. I'm a patient, and I'm a patient who's, who's, who sought out and found relief that I was not able to get from anything else. And it's been a part of my life now for 20 years. I'm one of those people that should have been in one of those randomized studies for 20 years. So you can search me out now at the end of it and say, okay, wow, you know, that's the effect that you've had. I understand. And my journey with cannabis over the 20 years, sorry over the 30 years now, really, has been one that's not been a roller coaster ride, but I, I noticed early on when, when I really started looking at cannabis as a medicine, you know, my early years, the first five or six years of, of daily use, I was seeking out higher CBD laden plants. As a matter of fact, and a lot of people don't know here in the United States, during the 70s and the 80s, most of the growers up in the Humboldt County area, up in Northern California, and even the ones that were down in Kentucky were trying their best to breed the CBD out of the plant. People don't know that. People don't know that we were trying our best to figure out how we, like they're still doing today, how we can achieve the highest THC number available under the sun as if the higher number is going to make a difference on the euphoria that you get. I, I have a lot to say about that. Um, but, but um you know, so we we really uh, mess with this plant in ways that we should have never messed with it to begin with, A. And then B, and when I started my journey again, like I said, I was seeking out higher CBD plants and I got a lot of relief. Now, what was very interesting though, when I look back in, you know, early 2001, two, three, four, five, you know, I had some people who literally would say, well, yeah, I got this heavy CBD plant here, we, I'm trying to get rid of it. If you want all the key, come out, I'll give you all you want. And I literally was taking it, and, and the plants were probably no more than the 7 to 10% CBD. Back then, maybe they weren't even that high. They were probably more like 5 to 7% CBD, and they were around 13 to 14% THC. And I can remember that, you know, back then, I got a lot of relief, not relief from the actual sensation of pain, but my brain was able to deal with the pain better. Yep. And, and I was able to put the pain in a box in a different way than I was before I started using cannabis. Then over time though, as you know, I, I sought out more and more trying to find higher CBD plants. And then literally when we started going to isolates and people were developing CBD isolates, well, the CBD by itself wasn't enough. Then I started realizing, wait a minute, then I do need some THC. So that's when I started finding different strains or what they call strains, but different um, genetics that I could mix those two together and come up with a combination for myself that was still in that range of that, you know, somewhere around, you know, seven and nine percent CBD and somewhere around 13 to 14 percent THC. Put the two together, even if the numbers look more like 14 percent and 21 percent, put the two together, it seemed to work. So I went on a journey with that for a while and then started pulling back on the plants that were claimed to be high in CBD and started actually using the plants that were seemed to be a little higher in THC. But then I got to a point of no return where the higher the THC did nothing for me. Right. You know, it really did. It was, it was a waste of my time. So then I started trying to back off it again. So then, you know, I got into the business myself and developed out my own products that I've been 
I'm happy to say that, uh, you know, I went through a couple of different rounds with this, but I was with a contract manufacturer for a while. I had a product in the marketplace that was a CBD product and a THC product in California, Oregon, and places that was legal. And my THC products were products that were a mixture of THC, CBD, and terpenes. I have a very specialized terpene formulation that I would put. So by volume, it would be about 5% terpene, you know, mm-hmm. and then I would go for 5% terpene and then split the other volume, 5 to 95% CBD to THC, 25% to 75% CBD to THC, 50-50, and then the reverse, 25-75. And I started to realize that, you know, that was really the perfect kinds of formulations for me because I could utilize one or two different pens at the same time to elicit the response that I needed at that time and recognizing that, you know, what I ate in the morning affected how I felt in the afternoon, especially when it came to to THC to, to cannabis. And so I think that we're going to, like I said, we're, we're just, you know, the Wright brothers still pushing that wooden plane down the hill. But as soon as we do a little bit more research on this, I think a lot more patients will find it easier to come to the table. I don't need to be blasted high all day long. I need relief. And, you know, the combination, of, I started to notice that the CBD on top of the THC literally took away some of that anxiety, actually buffered down some of that extreme high effect. And that's exactly what I wanted because I want to be able to function. You know I mean? I'm not sitting around vegetating on the couch all night long. I want to, you know I, mean? I want to be able to, to function and have a normal life, but just be able to put that pain in a box. And that's where I am now. And I'm hoping that I get the, you know, I'm, I'm, I just uh, penned a deal and finished uh, that this last week. Um, where hopefully I'll be back in the marketplace on the East Coast here within the next couple of weeks as we start to formulate and produce more product. I'm starting out with CBD products again, and I will start getting back into the THC products again, by, hopefully by the end of the summer. Great. Congratulations. That's awesome. No, thank you. I will say that I, I just wanted to interject that I, I'm one of the concerns I have about what's going on in Washington is that if we go from prohibition to legalization, what's the incentive for companies to do the research to right? The point, and I've I've been a consultant to a number of these cannabis producing companies. They, you know, they come to me and they say, Oh, doctor, we'd like you to help us with our research, right? And I say, Oh, great. Look, you've got some money in your pocket. Let's let's talk about you know how we can move the ball down the field. And unfortunately, what really happens is that they say, all right, well, what are the things you think we need to study? And I'll give them a list. And they say, all right, what's the price tag? And it's like, you know, 50 to 100 million dollars because that's what science costs. And suddenly you can see that the, they just turn off, right? I mean, right. Why, and I've had them say, you know, why would we spend that kind of money, you know, if we could just go and sell this in our dispensary right now? And the answer is they wouldn't and they won't. So, you know, something, if we just say that you can sell cannabis products, particularly in making claims about their medical utility without any requirement to prove it, then we're never going to get that kind of research that we need. And that's what I'm afraid of. But, you know, I, I, I can't, I, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm this ridiculous optimist who believes that eventually the wheat will rise above the chaff. It's going to do so. And it's the company that does the research that can back up what it says that will, you know, even though we live in a society right now where science seems to be, you know, a second thought. I think that's coming back. I think we're starting, people are starting to recognize the fact that that was stupid for four years. And now we really do need to look at research. I mean, you know, the argument about, you know, vaccines and things that are happening today, people recognize the fact that, you know, had we not come up with a vaccine for polio, you know, we would be a a ravaged planet. So they're recognizing, yes, science does have some utility and some value. I think they're going to come back to that, that fold in the next five or so years. And when they do so, they're going to start to recognize that, wait a minute, this is a company over here that put out a cannabis product that said it knows for a fact it does X, Y, Z because it spent that $50 million. It spent that 25, 30, 40 million bucks and did the double blind study. And you know, I'm always going to, and, and, and validated their claim. And right. I think that's where you'll see people start coming to the table again, especially once that validated claim is disseminated. And there are some people who say, geez, I did exactly what they said I should do. And guess what? It worked. Right. Well, I'd like to see the government step up a little bit and sort of regulate some of that a bit. Just, you know, because I think that 
you know, we're in love with capitalism in the country, but I'm not entirely sure. I think it solves all problems. And I think that the role for government when it's working properly, which we haven't seen a lot of lately, but when it's working properly is really to, to hold companies feet to the fire so that they prove the point. And I'd like to see that. And when, when we see, well, we're almost very, you know, here we are, we started off and should have been, you know, the number two country in the world when it comes to cannabis and cannabis research, but now we're probably down about number nine or 10. I mean, when you look at what's going on now in Africa, you look what's going on now in India, look what's going on now in China. You know, China's going to end up very quickly becoming one of the biggest hemp producers in the world. And who trusts? I don't trust. I would not put a product from China in my body if you paid me. You know what I mean? I, I couldn't see myself using CBD from China. <laughs> Screw that. You know, especially with the fact that we know that the, the, the plant itself leaches heavy metals and those kinds of things out of soil. And, and China is nothing more than a big waste dump. Uh, why would I use anything out of that country? But we have fallen behind because they're going to understand very quickly that hmm, if we do some research and we impress that American market, the rest of the world will follow. That's right. You know? right. and, and when it comes to studies like that, we're, we're side, I, I, I recently, I, I, I have my office does for me every single, every other month, they put together, you know, a deck of, you know, some of the most recent information that's been, you know, uh, uh, compiled on cannabis. And, you know, there was a CBD for pain relief study that was conducted at the, by scientists at Syracuse University that's demonstrated CBD's real effect on pain and the fact that they are twofold. One is a study that was published in April 28th of 2021. Um, it says that users benefit both from, both from the psychological expectation of thinking that CBD is going to work, but they also benefit from the pharmacological effects of the drug. And now been proven, and this was noticeably, let's see, these modes were of action appeared in effect <coughs> pain perception in different ways. While there are many observational studies in literature linking CBD used to effective pain relief, until recently they did not, there had not been uh, experimental studies designed to assess whether or not CBD was more effective than the placebo. <coughs> Excuse me. And to untangle those effects uh, from the actual effects of the drug, the researchers enrolled 15 patients, and that's a very small study, into the first human experimental study for PD, CBD for pain. And the study used special equipment that allowed the researchers to apply controlled heat pain and measurement, measure the participants' nervous system's responses. And during each of those sessions, the participants with sublingually or under the tongue given CBD isolate or a small amount of inert coconut oil as a placebo, the participants were told in the beginning that they were all receiving CBD and they noted that researchers found improvements in pain measures caused by the pharmacological effects of CBD, not just the psychological effects. And so I think, you know, to your point, I mean, now that was 15. We need to <coughs> improve that. Yeah. I mean, it's a very good beginning study. And, it, and as you said, it's the first study that is truly human based with a randomized, well, not randomized, but controlled uh, process. It's absolutely the step in the right direction. The other thing we have to look at, and I don't remember off the top of my head, is the dose they were getting because most people are getting from their garden variety CBD way, 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 way lower doses than what we see are effective in, based in the lab. Um, and most of those studies in lab are, of course, mouse based, which is not all that applicable. But you know, you're right. We're we're people think somehow that I'm anti-CBD. And what I tell people is I'm not pro-cannabis, I'm not anti-cannabis, I am pro-patient. So if it works and we can show it works, then I'm all for it. And if we can't or haven't, then I think we need to kind of really think about whether we're championing that. Well, I gotta give you a big applause because after I'm reading another one here, researchers working with the Harvard Medical School and McLean Hospital in Boston completed a longitudinal long-term study the researchers evaluated, and this was published uh, March 25th of 2021. And the researchers uh, uh, evaluated the use of medical cannabis by chronic pain patients, most of whom were either had muscular skeletal pain or neuropathy. And patients were evaluated for factors including pain, clinical state, sleep, quality of life, and conventional medications used before the onset of their treatments. And the data revealed that 
um, a sustained improvement in patients' symptoms and participant symptoms for those who use THC and CBD. So I applaud Harvard for jumping in and doing a nice study and publishing that. But I mean, I, I, I kind of try my best to stay on top of as many of these studies as possible and make sure I share those with the public. So, and these will all be up on our website. So people who want to know, I'll put a link up there so you can read the study yourself and get information for you. What do you think though, doc, uh, over the next, you know, you're right in the middle of this, my friend. And I can't say I applaud you even louder for being in the middle, but where do you, how do you, how do you think, uh, what do you think is going to, going to turn from the federal standpoint do you think that we're going to make that step and say you know yes we need to look at two categories of cannabis decriminalize recreational use and you know help us determine medical use what do you think is coming down the pike in the next say two years you know um i can tell you what i hope for and what i think is more likely at the moment there's so much discussion about legalization uh you know revolving around the very absolutely reasonable social justice issues, but nobody seems to have clued into the fact that healthcare is a social justice issue. Um, and, and so I'm afraid that the federal government is going to do something that has no nuance to it, that doesn't think about patients as separate from and different from recreational users. And, uh, and I'm, so I'm concerned that we may end up with something that is better than prohibition without question, but not as um, not as thoughtful and not as helpful to patient care and to um, and to development of the research that we've been talking about. So I'm I'm a little worried about that. It's part of the reason that um, I started the Association of Cannabis Specialists some years ago, um, and we have lobbying efforts down in D.C. trying to just get the lawmakers to to recognize that there's a whole other facet here, and perhaps even a larger facet in terms of of, of number of, of people. Um, and it was interesting because I had a conversation with one of the staffers from Senator Warren's office a couple of weeks ago, and she was very smart and very tuned in. And um, But what she said is, you know, you're right. Nobody's talking about patient care in Washington. It's just not on anybody's agenda. And I thought, how can we have this plant that everyone has now since 96 been focused on its medical and like now we're just not even, you know, like we've just kind of dumped the medical concept and we're only talking about yes. legalization. Well, it's because the states are looking at this as a as a way to get them out of a recession or to get them out of, you know, it's the, the, yeah, it's a tax issue. And I, I mean, I don't, again, I think, um, you know, when I, I'm, I've been talking to people and, and reach out to, you know, cannabis entrepreneurs all over the world. And I recently spoke to some in South Africa. I've spoken to some in South America. You know, we are very, in, in a very short order, are getting ready to be eclipsed by the production ability of foreign countries, noting that this is the marketplace that they can start shipping isolates into. And, um, you know, it's that uh, capitalistic attitude that's going to, you know, hurt this industry, I think, for probably five to 10 years before we come out of that, snap out of that. I think you're absolutely right. And it's, you know, it's my hope that we can kind of convince Washington to, to, to think, be more thoughtful about this. Um, and I think you're right also that at the end of a longish period of time, maybe that's 10 years, maybe it's 20 years as this industry matures, we're going to see who's left, you know, and I think that the people who are left are the ones who are going to come at this thinking about the long term, thinking essentially about kind of like a pharmaceutical company. How do we find things about the plant or derive from the plant that are helpful? And then how do we prove it? And how do we make sure that this lives up to a standard of evidence that that then makes it not controversial to take care of somebody using that? Um, yeah, you know, I recently read an article of a politician just from about two weeks ago. Uh, no, not a politician, a doctor who uh, was testifying before one of the states in the South that was trying to implement a medical cannabis law and, uh, initiative. And she was saying that, you know, this is like an oxymoron. You can't use medical and cannabis in the same sentence. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, how do we get more doctors like you to get the word out that there's nothing offensive about looking at cannabis as a medicine? We look at, you know, um, 
other plants, so there's other plants that have been used as plant-based medicine. So why not stop for a second, throw out all the bad data and just be open enough to accept? How do we get more doctors to, to, to take a stand like you've taken? Well, I think part of it is that, you you know, a hundred years ago, doctors were cowboys, right? And they, they were doing the best they could in trying to keep people healthy. And now we have a much more sophisticated uh, industry in medicine and um, doctors are less used to or less willing to sort of fly by the seat of their pants. And that's good news as well as bad news. So I think that, you know, to really get more physicians uh, uh, to understand this, we need we need not just better studies, but we need to do a better job of disseminating the studies that we have. I think that a lot of physicians simply think that there are no data, which as we've discussed is not actually accurate. And I, and I also think that we also have to recognize that most physicians are never gonna practice this kind of medicine. It's too, there's too much depth to it. There are too many complications. And so most doctors aren't cardiologists. They're not endocrinologists. They know enough about those fields that they can handle sort of the, the general common issues, but then they refer their patients to specialists. And I think that the endocannabinologist is a, is a field that's gonna grow. I mean, that's why I started again, the Association of Cannabis Specialists, um, because I think that we need to educate general physicians about sort of the broad picture of what it's good for, what it's not good for. And then we need to educate the specialists so that they really understand the nitty gritty stuff. And so we can get into the, the, the details of taking care of people. You know, Dr. Mom's out of time, but then could you think of a, uh, maybe a couple of, of things that maybe our listeners need to hear uh, any, any breakthroughs that you've heard of? I mean, I gave you, you know, some examples of some studies that I was able to fall apart or come up, come up with, but any studies that you've heard recently or any breakthroughs recently that, just might excite people to say, hey, you know what? Wow, if they're thinking that way, hmm, maybe this is okay. Well, there was a study that's now a, a couple years old, also done at McLean by Stacy Gruber, um, who's an exceptional researcher. And what she had been doing is a series of studies that looked at the effect of cannabis and THC dominant cannabis on um, the cognitive facilities of normal healthy volunteers. And not surprisingly, cognitive uh, function in normal, healthy people is not as good when they're intoxicated as when they're not intoxicated. That to me is like, duh, right? But what was much more interesting was that after she had done a series of those studies on, on normal people, then she started looking at medical patients, right? And what she found was that the cognitive abilities of those people who are being treated as a medical patient with cannabis actually improved. Right. And the the theory being that being sick isn't very good for your cognitive function. And so if we can relieve some of those symptoms using cannabis, your cognitive function may not return to what it once was, but it still may be vastly better than what it is prior to treatment. And I think that that's a hugely important study. Again, when we start to think about getting colleagues involved, because you know, we can understand that people are not necessarily doing well when they're sick. And if the cannabis isn't this sort of boogeyman that makes you, you know, lose your, your cognitive facilities, but rather actually improves it for patients, then I think, you know, all we have to remember that, that doctors are people too, and they, and they have their biases. And we're all a certain age anyway, we're subjected to Nancy Reagan's just say no, and eggs and frying pans and all those sorts of things. So being able to kind of overcome that ingrained stigma is, is difficult. And studies like that, I think are important to really kind of shed light, you know, in an non-biased way that, that physicians can say, oh, you know what? Now I get it. And I think that that's really important. Well, you know, there was a public, there was a study that came out March 22nd of 2021 showing that no evidence that medical cannabis access laws encourage youth marijuana use. Right. And this one just came out. This was done by both Johns Hopkins as well as Harvard. There you guys are again. Mm -hmm. And the Massachusetts Can Cannabis Control Commission uh, reviewed cannabis use trends in more than 1 million adolescents, grades 9 through 12, in 46 states over nearly 25-year period of time. The study found no evidence 
between 1991 and 2015 of increases in adolescents reporting past 30-day marijuana use or heavy marijuana use uh, associated with uh, marijuana laws enacted in those marijuana states or where there are marijuana dispensaries. And it also goes into a little bit about the fact that it, um, here, um, oh, that, that, no. so it kind of follows suit that, you know, there's more information out there than people know. I even got a study here that talks about, you know, cannabinoids will help with pathological um, tremors. And we now know that they affect certain areas of the spinal cord that literally do affect tremors in people, Parkinson's, other illnesses like MS. Um, so there's good data out there now. These are This is data that's now coming in, in the form of 10, 15, 20-year studies. This is crazy. Right. Yep. It's, it's really a matter of making sure that the people who need to read these studies know that they exist. Um, and again, the Association of Cannabis Specialists really focuses on that. And for example, we have what we call the Clinical Reference Library, which aims to take that sort of now 35,000 studies that are in PubMed and really cone it down to the sort of 50 to 100 studies that are that are the things that you really need to read that, that, that explain, you know, what we know in each field. So in, in neurology and in ALS and in MS, uh, in oncology, various tumors, all of these sorts of things. And so for the members of the organization, that's a, that's a resource. There's some really introductory stuff. And then I kind of see this as the middle ground. It's like once you've kind of gotten your head around some of the beginning data, now how do I drill down? And, um, and I think that that's really important. Um, you know, working with the, with the university to develop educational resources for non-cannabis specialists. How how cool will it be if we can get Harvard Medical School to put out a cannabis-related um, uh, CME course? And so we're we're talking about it. That would be unbelievable. I think it would be great. And I, you know, I, I will uh, just end by saying that you know it uh, it was a doctor at uh, Harvard that literally put me on my course for cannabis almost 25, well, 30 years ago and, or 20 years ago and uh, literally saved my life. He saved my life from um, opioid addiction because I was headed down the wrong path because when I first got diagnosed with MS, you know, my primary symptom was neuropathic pain. And back then, of course, the only way the doctors knew how to treat it was, you know, shoving more and more opioids in your, in your system. And, you know, I, I figured out very quickly how to chase as much as many prescriptions for that as I could. And uh, it almost shut my liver down, almost shut my kidneys down. And um, based on a recommendation from a doctor who said, look, I'm not going to tell you I was able to tell I told you this, but I think you ought to see if you could get some benefits out of cannabis. Because I've heard from other MS patients that, you know, they've benefited. And, um, but I'm not going to tell you I ever told you that. Yeah, of course not. Yeah, of course not. They couldn't do it. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad he said it to me that way because that really made me dig in as deeply as I could to do as much research as I could. So I thank you and I thank Harvard and I, I thank you for what you're doing now, sir. And um, you always have a home here. If ever you want to just kick and chop it up a little bit about new research and new things that are coming out, I'd love to have you back because I know our viewers are really interested in the research, the research, the research. Sounds great. Thank you for having me on. This was a pleasure. No, Dr. Tissel, thank you so much, sir. And you know what you got to do. All of you out there, make sure you tune into the next edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Thanks for joining me on Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear your feedback also, so please send us your comments. <laughs>